Hello, and welcome back to the Video Essay Podcast. I'm your host, Will DeGravio, joined here with the one and only... Emily Co. <laughs> hey! <laughs> the show's a wonderful associate producer. We just got finished recording a, a great conversation with Cormac Donnelly and Gemma Saunders uh, that you're about to listen to, um, all about life as a PhD student working with video essays, pursuing an audiovisual, a videographic practice research, PhD, uh, whatever term you want to call it. And yeah, Emily, what did you, Emily has heard, um, I kind of <laughs> was, because just starting my PhD, I was like kind of in and asking all these questions. Um, but Emily got in a really uh, great question and conversation during um, during our talk, but was really on the outside listening in. So I'm curious, Emily, what did you make of that conversation? I thought it was really interesting. We covered so much because both Gemma and Cormac, they're working on different things and they're working on things that question or challenge what one would think a video essay is or what, what one would assume a video essay is. You're going to be hearing the episode, um, so I don't want to spoil too much, but we're, we covered television, the role of sound in the video essay. Um, and so I, I think it's interesting because we sort of get to this discussion about the relationship between writing and the video essay. Um, and so I'm really excited about this episode. Yeah. And I think it was very refreshing because not often on this show do we talk about like something that's in progress, right? Like we usually talk about like, you made this amazing video essay, walk us through it. But there were so many moments in this conversation where it was like, Huh, I'm not really sure where this project is going, or I think I'll be done around this time, or well, it started off as this, and so I think it, it's it's really healthy, and or just really exciting to hear two people be in the middle of something and kind of get a window into that creative scholarly process. I thought was really cool. Absolutely, and it's interesting that we didn't just talk about one video essay. Um, both Gemma and Cormac, they're using the video graphic essay form to make new discoveries and to make discoveries that they could not make in writing. And so um, it's it, it's interesting how they're working through their ideas as they're producing these uh, video essays. It's great. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the goals in this episode was to really try and be useful to those of you out there. I've had so many conversations with folks literally around the world as we talk about in the episode, trying to figure out what does a videographic PhD look like? How can I make this happen at my university? So I hope that this is helpful to all of you as I'm trying to figure out what this looks like. And you'll learn even Cormac and Gemma are trying to figure it out. For you too, Emily, who just finished up her first year at Columbia, uh, master's program in film studies. So congratulations to you, Emily, uh, on that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, without further ado, here is our conversation with Cormac and Gemma. I am now so thrilled to be joined, um, along with Emily, uh, by two folks who uh, have been long standing supporters, friends of the podcast. You've heard their voices before. Um, in various kind of listener specials, or I think Cormac was in the Cary Grant episode, um, things like that. Um, but so pleased to have them here in a, in, a, in a formal capacity to talk about the very exciting graduate work uh, that they are doing. Uh, we have Gemma Saunders and Cormac Donnelly. Uh, Gemma, Cormac, welcome to the Video Essay Podcast. It's so great to have you here. Thanks. So Thank much. you. Well. <laughs> and you know, I think we'll just kick things off with with a brief introduction. Um, and Gemma, we'll we'll start with you. Um, could you just you know talk to us about your academic and professional background, um, and really kind of what led you to 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 PhD studies um, 
in particular. And then we can kind of get into the nitty gritty of kind of your, your projects more specifically. Yeah, sure. So um, I actually did my undergraduate degree in medieval and modern history at the University of Birmingham. Um, but I've always loved TV. Um, I have to confess, I'm not actually the biggest film nerd out there. But anyway, um, I then went straight from doing my undergrad into an MA, um, which was then called History, Film and Television. And the final dissertation for that was a 25 minute documentary, um, which I absolutely loved making. I did it all about Robin Hood and kind of representations of him and Nottingham and things like that. Um, and then I tried to work in industry for a while. Um, but living in Birmingham and for people outside the UK, you know, although it is the second city, the kind of fortunes of the TV industry and kind of media production here have gone very up and down in the last decade or so. Um, and at that time, it was kind of in one of its downward troughs. Um, so I freelanced for a while. I did a few kind of researcher production coordinator type roles. And then I found myself back at the university. Um, looking after placements for MA students, um, which I still do. Um, and I absolutely love it. But, you know, that kind of, it was great because it tied into my interest in film and TV. Um, but then I've always kind of been into research as well. Um, and I was always kind of vaguely thinking maybe one day I'd like to do a PhD, but I, I, I wasn't ready. So um, eight years down the line from um, finishing my MA, I finally kind of you know, working in the Department of Film and Creative Writing for me is a real benefit as well. But um, I knew that there was an audiovisual PhD um, option. Not many people had done it at that point. Um, but then a colleague of mine started running a module. Um, I think its official title is Digital and Documentary Filmmaking, the Video Essay. It's a very long title, but um, I was really intrigued by this. I'd never really heard about video essays as such. Um but I, I went along and audited that module. I loved it. And then that's what really got me thinking about kind of returning to study. Um, so that's slightly long winded. But yes, for me, that was kind of how I came to it through a mixture of professional experience and just really enjoying study as well. When I was first learning about video essay, Rob Stone's um, videos were works that I was watching. It was like a very early um, influence for me. And so it was Rob already teaching video essay at, at, at Birmingham and like was that kind of already going on as you began your your, your PhD like and, and what is kind of the beyond Rob I don't know much about I, but I know that Birmingham since in the past few years has really been doing a lot of things on video essay um, so has that been long-standing like what is what is that just kind of departmental history and tradition been like? Yeah, so um, it's quite a small department, but um, that's actually really lovely because it's a great community. But um, I was also aware of Rob's work, but actually the the colleague um, who is actually now one of my co-supervisors, Richard Langley, was the person who started running that undergraduate module. Um, and you know, Rob is my PhD mentor, and he's wonderful. And you know, every member of staff in that department comes with different kind of perspectives, whether they are more practice focused or more research focused. Um, so Rob kind of was always ticking along in the background. I don't know if that's quite the right turn of phrase, um, but Richard, you know, came from an industry background as well as having his PhD. And he was actually the second person um, at the university to do the audiovisual PhD, which is what they call it. So he was kind of really well positioned to begin teaching this undergraduate module. I think just as video essays as a form were starting to kind of enter conversations a little more widely. Um, and I would say within the academic staff in the department, there is quite a kind of even balance between those who are a little bit more practice focused and a little bit more um, research focused. But um, I feel that, you know, between them, they, they do bring these two kind of critical and creative practices together very well. So it's a really nice culture. And I'm not sure that answers the question, but um, yeah. It absolutely does. Because, you know, the UK, I know from my limited time there as a grad student and then in the year since, has a very rich kind of practice research tradition where folks are getting PhDs in a range of audiovisual product projects um so you know it, it makes sense why video essay would kind of it has has i think really in the, in the last few years been kind of taken up uh as part of uh, that tradition uh but cormac as someone who i know also has an, an industry background tell us your you know your story about how what led you to kind of you know taking the phd journey so to speak <laughs> yeah i i uh i did an undergraduate uh Film studies um, at Wolverhampton uh, quite quite a considerable time ago now, um, and after that I 
I did shop around for, for jobs. I even went as far as going down to London. Um, and I have a big sheaf, about an inch thick of rejection letters from every film production company in London, I think. Um, because at the time I was I was looking for entry positions and, and the market was kind of flooded with people like me who wanted to, to get started. So I went into, uh, you know, I went into the world of work and got a job in an office and, you know, was quite, quite happy, I think. Um, and then uh, I moved to Manchester and I discovered an evening class in uh, audio engineering. So while I was working full time, I then did this diploma in audio engineering and that was about 18 months. And on the last day of my diploma, I quit my job, um, signed a lease on a, an old derelict building in North Manchester and opened a recording studio, which I ran for four years. And that's what kind of got me back into the creative space, I suppose. I started recording bands, working on sound for film, getting hooked into a kind of a local music scene and a local filmmaking scene. And um, off the back of that, in about 2009, friend of mine asked me to come in and do some practical lecturing with some science students um, and that was the start of my kind of my teaching journey and that led me to a point where I had to make a decision about what I was going to do was I going to be a part-time lecturer or full-time kind of industry grafter or was I going to commit to into getting into academia so I went back to went back to school and did a master's uh, in 2014 in sound design and yeah a little bit like Gemma actually kind of after that I realized I really enjoyed research and I really enjoyed kind of these kind of bigger projects that I was kind of finding myself doing uh especially for for conference presentations and uh at about uh sometime in 2017 I decided to start thinking about looking for a PhD and uh, it was actually Rob Stone, um, who suggested, <laughs> after I'd contacted him, he suggested that I reach out to Liz Green at John Murray's in Liverpool, who might be a good person to speak to about doing a PhD, um, specifically because I was interested in film sound, not because at that time I even knew what a video essay was. Do you, do you remember when you first kind of encountered the video essay? And then specifically when, when and how or when and why, uh, did that appeal to you as a way into PhD study, right? Because um, I, I imagine maybe they were, those were two separate encounters, but I'd be curious to hear them both. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't remember specifically when I encountered video essays, although I know it was, um, it would have been lunchtimes at my last teaching job. So before I started my PhD and... I would be on, I, th I think I was, I think someone had recommended I check out every frame of painting, right? Which is probably, <laughs> it's probably like a reasonably standard answer. Right? But I think someone said, why don't you, you're interested in films, look at this. And I looked at it and I remember, I think I binged through like, uh, you know, 12 or 15 of them in one really, really long lunch break, <laughs> probably longer than it should have been. Um, but I didn't, See, that's, that's the strange thing, right? I didn't necessarily either acknowledge or label or understand those things to be a video essay. They just, they felt like a, a, a product of YouTube, which would be a useful way to engage with, with, with an audience. Um, it never occurred to me that they would be, you know, uh, something that, first of all, that I would be interested in making because they seemed, I mean, you watch it, pick any, any frame, uh, every frame of painting and watch it. And it's so meticulously edited and beautifully um, voiceovered and uh, and also really confident. There's such a confidence in the way it's delivered. Like everything is, they, they know exactly what they're saying and they know exactly why they're saying it. And um, so I don't think I ever felt like I could make that. So I didn't even, it never occurred to me to, to think about it until, yeah, until I kind of, I, I was having a chat with Liz Green at John Moore's about starting a PhD there, which was a traditional thesis-led PhD. And um, and she said, have you ever thought about making a, a video essay? And uh, I said, no. <laughs> she said, well, here's a, here's a couple of links. Check them out and then see if you think um, this might be something that would be interesting for you to try. Um, and it might be interesting for you to think about as part of your PhD research. I think that was kind of the, 
it was kind of a go away and think about it kind of thing. So I went away and thought about it. <laughs> and now you're here. <laughs> now I'm here. <laughs> Spoiler it's alert. Now a you're seamless, here. <laughs> a seamless transition five years later, <laughs> six years later, yeah. however long it was. Yeah. So, so Gemma, yeah. What, is, what has that been like for you? Like, do you remember when you first encountered video essay and then when did you start to think, huh, this, this, this could maybe be how I find myself into this audiovisual PhD. I mean, it's, it's so like funny, but I guess, natural that Cormac's just said every frame of painting because that's definitely my first kind of um that's the first thing I can remember and actually for me the every frame of painting episode uh, episode video um on Vancouver never plays itself um I would say that for me was a direct influence because you know one of the things I'm looking at and I know I'm jumping the gun slightly but you know is is when does Birmingham play itself on screen so you know there's that direct connection there but really I suppose I, I think the MA that I did focused a lot on documentary and different kind of modes of documentary and storytelling and the way in which we use film or audiovisual media to tell stories or to kind of convey feeling narrative, um, but very much in a factual sense. And I think actually, in a way, video essays could be seen as a form of documentary. Um, so I suppose the documentary I made for my master's dissertation was in a way kind of already edging along that route um but yeah it was when I audited the the video essay module in its first run um obviously catching up on my day work later on into the day um that I I think I started playing with juxtaposition and um the first thing I ever made was um is a uh, sections of Peaky Blinders which um is kind of huge here um and obviously it's got global appeal and then um, putting that next to Benefit Street which um may not be as well known but basically was a kind of well it was called a documentary by some people but it was kind of a there were some ethical ethically dubious things going on but it was basically looking at a community living in Birmingham where a lot of the residents were living on benefits and um, I think it was just the first time that I'd kind of put these two or any two pieces of kind of tv or audiovisual text side by side on on the editing timeline and I thought okay I can explore things here that I can't do just in writing or I can do it in a very different way and I will gain new insights by doing this that I can't do purely by kind of exploring my thoughts with words and a word processing software so I think that for me was kind of the prompt and then I thought okay I think there's more I want to explore here and it quickly became apparent that I wasn't going to manage that in a kind of five minute piece. No I, I love hearing that and I think that's a perfect segue to you kind of could you just tell us kind of give us an introduction to your project um, and what you're pursuing as PhD. And I would be especially interested to hear about um, how that idea, because I know you've both been at this for a few years now. I, I'm wondering if um, your ideas have evolved over time. I assume they have in, in the scope of the project. So could you take us to how you originally conceived the project and then maybe walk us through to what it's it's looking like uh, today with the caveat knowing that it could change tomorrow or a week from now or or years from now <laughs> you're not locked in here <laughs> <laughs> i was just thinking a book arrived in the post for me today called car architecture and i was thinking gosh Gemma of like 15 years ago would never have ordered a book about cars and architecture but um, anyway um yeah so i think it kind of it sprang partly from as i mentioned like i work with ma students um, looking to work in in industry and so i've been very interested in kind of how that's worked in birmingham but then i was also interested in things that are set here and things that are filmed here so my initial kind of ideas after making that first let's call it video essay um because I know that that's another whole area of discussion um but I suppose my initial thoughts were kind of okay well what when do we actually see Birmingham as Birmingham on screen so I thought okay I want to explore this I want to look beyond Peaky Blinders and because the general kind of answer would be when I first started doing my PhD and I'd say oh, I'm looking at how Birmingham's represented in film and TV and people would say well it's not um so that was kind of my starting point of let's look at when it is and what I'm trying to do is explore its kind of aesthetic identity through repurposing critically um some of those existing texts that are both set and filmed here and I think I am moving more to things that are set here I mean I, I started doing this in 2018 I have had a bit of time out um for maternity leave um I also work full time so I'm doing it as a part-time project which is for me works really well because it means the passion and the interest stays um but it's yeah certainly developed in that time I know that I reread my um, initial proposal the other day which is 
that's the thing to go back to and you go oh wow and then sometimes you go oh that's quite interesting then you get no no what was I thinking um but I I use the phrase location chameleon a lot there and I think I was looking at oh and is Birmingham the location chameleon and I mean I've completely kind of well, not completely but I can't remember the last time I actually thought about that something that may edge its way into the final piece so um yeah I think my ideas are kind of definitely gravitating more towards televisual depictions of the city um I have no idea where I'm at in terms of structure I'll be completely honest um but you know I'm just at the moment I'm really having fun and exploring kind of different themes I suppose so hence architecture book I'm looking at um roads and canals at the moment um so yeah as you can tell I'm not entirely sure what the entire project is but I suppose my central question is looking at when Birmingham plays itself and looking at how it's portrayed um in film and television and I'm thinking about having um 2022 as my cutoff point for kind of actually looking at content um because otherwise I'll never stop and also kind of we had we had the Commonwealth Games here last year which was amazing and um, it was the final series of Peaky Blinders and while I am very keen to go beyond Peaky Blinders I think it's such a kind of global phenomenon um that I have to kind of bring it in and that seems a good end point to me I hope I love that and I'm I'm obviously familiar with your work but I don't think I had fully realized what you do professionally in terms of placing students in industry like that's such an interesting perspective on it that kind of allows you to be uh, a player an active role in industry but looking on the outside kind of looking in right like that that's so fascinating does that shape kind of how it, like the academic side of it yeah sometimes like yeah because I mean it, it's really nice because kind of through my job I have contacts in industry who have you know some of them are very kindly offered to be interviewed for the thesis um and you know you you kind of get these insights into how the industry is progressing um and it's something that I care about very much you know I love seeing students kind of get the jobs that they want and but there's a real especially now there's a, a real buzz around Birmingham um I think you know um we've got some shows moving out of London to come here next year and I feel like it's a good kind of I'm losing my thread as I often do um it's a really exciting time for media in Birmingham and while my kind of professional life does look at that as well like it's nice to have in my PhD life um that kind of ongoing engagement with the aesthetics rather than the industry if that makes sense I'm not sure but um yeah it, it definitely the two intertwine quite a lot which is both wonderful and not so wonderful depending on how much of a brain kind of overload you want that makes sense. Definitely two different approaches and ways of thinking about it, for sure. Um, Cormac, same question to you. Um, you know, t- walk us through the project, and I know that you've you've since switched universities <laughs> um, in 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 taking on the project. So, um, yeah, e- eager to, eager to hear about yours. <laughs> well, my my initial pitch was about. See, there's there's all these like little weird crossovers that only became apparent to me as I as I got into it. So my initial pitch was largely based on Chris Keithley's book about cinephilia. And I didn't know Chris Keithley made video essays. I knew he'd written a book about cinephilia. So, and I loved it. And I, that really inspired me to think about, I suppose, to think about sound practitioners who work in film as kind of professional cinephiliacs who are like constantly working with, um, old sounds, sounds that have been in sound libraries for years or hiding little kind of fun sonic jokes in film soundtracks that only other sound people get unless it becomes something like the Wilhelm scream and then everybody gets it eventually. But, you know, they, the, that was my initial pitch. And um, like I said, when I, when I, when I pitched this to, to Liz at, at Liverpool, um, she actually said, Oh, well, you know, Chris made a video essay called Pass the Salt. Maybe you should watch it. And I watched that and it, it blew my mind in the, in the context of here's a thing I think I could make, not like uh, an every frame the painting, which I still don't think I could make. But um, I felt like there was an approach that, that Chris had taken with that video essay that said something to me as someone who could who wanted to try and make something like that. So then I made... Um, so off the back of that, and over a period of about 12 months, I made Panscan Venkman. But then I didn't know what that was in terms of my 
my PhD and my kind of then then my, this this PhD that I just started was already kind of up in the air as far as I was concerned because now I was um, now I was thinking about video essays as being a core part of it and I didn't know how that fitted with the idea of cinephilia and the film sound and so it was already changing from like I don't know like the first couple of weeks my my PhD was already on the move in terms of what it was going to be but um, it gradually became more about uh, the video essay as a form rather than necessarily me making video essays about anything. I was still, you know, my PhD focus is still film sound. Um, and I'm still making video essays and I have made video essays about various aspects of, of film sound and various aspects of, um, of film sound production practice. But the thesis that I'm now working on is kind of there's like a really simple core statement, which is, which is kind of my my provocative, I suppose, what I'm what I'm looking at, which is um, if you're making a, a video essay about sound, what does the video do? And that was kind of that was a really interesting question that I was asked, and I thought, well, that's a that's the whole thing right there. That's the <laughs> that's it. I've got it. I've cracked it finally. Although I didn't crack it, someone had to crack it for me. But um, and that so that then that allowed me to kind of look back at some of the practice I'd done in my first couple of years. So uh, Panskan Venkman, uh, my mind essay and, and Sonic Chronicle and think about those in terms of well, what had I done with the video in those? And, and then what, if I was to take that as a kind of a starting point, as a, a kind of a baseline for my practice, then what could I have the video do? And so that's where I'm at. I'm, uh, nearly four years into five years, so I'll be finished um, not far off this time, twelve months, um, or at least I'll be hoped. I hope to be finished, and and that's my, you know, that's my that's my thesis now. I my my fancy title, if you want it, is um, sound before picture towards a sound led videographic criticism. It took me a long time to come up with that, and I had to ask my son for help as well. Pitched him a few ideas and he picked that one. He said that was the best. So. Titles are horrible. I, like, I struggle <laughs> so much with titles for anything. And yeah, I still don't know what my thesis will be called. But It was it was a whole page full of them. And, and it was like, that one sounds good. And I was like, great, let's do that one. I love it. That's great. And I love how your project is taking on also like a, a kind of a more meta quality to it and, and reflecting on, on video essay. So will that be like a, is, will that be writing or do the, yeah. So how, yeah, what's that breakdown like? Well, I, I suppose this is one of the things, right? This is one of the, the, the if, you know, if, if we're interested in what a, a practice PhD looks like when you're making video essays, there is a kind of a, well, it'd be interesting to hear. I know, I think Gemma, we actually had a chat about this a little while ago, but you know, what the unwritten written rules are of this. Um, so at Glasgow, where I am now with Ian Garwood, and Karen Lurie, um, there is a kind of an expectation of a, about somewhere in the region of an hour or so of practice material, whatever that looks like. And then that's 50%. So then the other 50% would be about 40,000 words of thesis. So my breakdown, and I mean, this is, you know, in terms of, you know, when do you figure these things out? I imagine it's going to be different for every single PhD, but I only really figured out the structure of mine probably just before christmas so you know that's well into my you know fourth year of working on this thing um but it was only again it was only really because I, i'd spent all of that time pretty much constantly in the back of your head it just kind of turns along you know especially in a part time and i think Gemma made a great point about maintaining interest in it i think the part time process that i'm engaged in similarly is has allowed me to continue to just keep mulling on things and not necessarily feel massively pressured to constantly be producing something like you might feel if you were you know trying to get this done in three years so you know over that time i've finally gotten to a point where i've figured out a chapter structure for a thesis and how that then relates to a video essay practice as well so each chapter is about a couple of video essays and how that has developed almost kind of as an iterative process from that first video essay through to 
hopefully some sort of larger project which might reflect on um, some some methods that might be useful for for a sound led videographic practice. Gemma, I don't know if you've had conversations like that with your supervisors, but what what generally has been that that discussion um, in terms of uh, yeah benchmarks and things things like that? Well, I think it's um, broadly similar, actually, in that they say, you know, an hour-ish of documentary in the broader sense of the term content. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm wrestling with at the moment is, will I have an overarching, say, 60-minute film that has kind of some of my pre-existing videographic experiments in that that I've made over the last few years? Will they be kind of self-contained vignettes within that piece? Will it have an overarching narrative or will it be more of a portfolio approach and a friend of mine who's close to submitting, um, he's made five films, one of which is about half an hour, one of which is like a two minute primer. Um, but, you know, I think it's for us at Birmingham very flexible as long as we have a clear rationale for why we've taken that methodological approach. Um, and then our written component is, I think it's 30,000. Um, I don't think that's going to be enough. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, but I think it's they're very clear and my supervisors uh, Richard and James are both great um, and they say you know as long as you can justify it and it makes sense for the the research itself um, so I mean one thing I'm toying with is kind of if Birmingham has a fragmented audiovisual identity can I adopt a quite fragmented and exploratory approach with what I present um, we see but yeah I, I do think that it's, it can be difficult especially when you know, one of the joys of it is that you can be creative and do things a little bit differently, but that's also quite a challenge, um, as I'm sure Cormac can uh, attest to. Um, yeah. It's funny you say that because I was just, so I'm in the, pro part of the reason we'll have this conversation is I've just started my PhD at the University of Amsterdam, looking at avant-garde film, film archiving, and the video essay, and essentially thinking about how videographic criticism can animate experimental film archives. Um, still living in New York and I'm dealing with American avant-garde film, but studying with uh, Jep Koyman and um, Floris Palman at uh, University of Amsterdam. And one of the things we were talking about, I had sort of like kind of a welcome meeting where we talked about it in a very loose way, kind of what these structures would look like. And one of the things that Jap was talking about, and I agree was it was very important to make sure that the video essays were recognized as the research. In, in not just a supplement to the writing. And what you just said, Gemma, reminded me of something that we were talking about, which is that I'm far more concerned about whatever writ, we haven't decided on the number of words that I will have to write, but I was way more concerned with how few words <laughs> I, I would have access to than, <laughs> than too many, right? Which is this kind of interesting, I don't know, it, it's almost made me not have what I would have first thought. Like, I think sometimes the gut instinct is like, oh, you get to write less if you're doing a video. But actually, maybe the challenge is, that's part of the challenge, right? Is not just doing what maybe perhaps we're more used to doing in 80% of our academic life, which is which is writing. Do you find that, do either of you find that to be the case? I was just going to say, actually, I think a lot of people, when you tell them you're doing an audiovisual pitch, they're like, oh, cool, so you're just making films. And there's this like this notion that it's somehow easier um and yeah that's so not true and um I know that you know picking up on that kind of recognizing the you know the, the practice work as part of the research that's absolutely crucial you know it's not just again I think another common perception is oh yeah I'm really interested in this so I'll make a film about it and that's not what in my understanding an audiovisual PhD is you know it's about kind of really finding the right form not only for presenting that research, but the actual practice of making and is part of the research, um, which I haven't articulated that well, though, but that's kind of my understanding, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think that's that's a really good point. I mean, I think that was one of the things that perhaps I came unstuck with after making some video essays and then kind of confronting this question about where was this actually going, you know, I... I'm making these video essays. I'm really enjoying it and it's great and I'm loving doing a PhD. And then, you know, you come up against that that kind of rationale question, which is, okay, Cormac, you've done some work. This is all good. This is going well. But where is this where is this going to go in a few years' time? And it's like, oh, yeah. 
I mean, let me mull on that one for a month or two while I try and figure out where it's going. And I mean, that was, you know, that was the point then where, where the reality of what that written exegesis would actually do for me. What was that? And how did that link to the work? But then how did I actually want to organize the work so that they would they would go together? And I think the point about words is is great. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna do the practice and you've then gotta it, it's like, you know, it's like video essay constraints, wasn't it? All of a sudden you've got a constraint on your word count. I don't think anyone said to me, you know, you can't write more, but I think the expectation is that you will <laughs> You know, if you're going to present this much videographic content, then your word count has to kind of come down to meet that. Um, but yeah, the the point about video uh, video content being easier. Um, it's a, I, I mean, I don't know how you feel, Gemma, but I think it's a good job I'm doing this part time. Otherwise, none of this would ever have been made. <laughs> yeah, it's a it goes both ways, really. I mean, it's um, but yeah, just the time. I mean, you know, if you. are if you're working with TV in particular, you know, the hours of episodes and depending on how you work, you might be screen capturing all that, then compressing all of that and then filing it somewhere nice. And, you know, media management is just one aspect of it. And I'm sure that everyone has their own filing systems for their articles and everything they're reading. Um, but, you know, that's before you actually start working with the material. So, yeah, the time is just um, a huge, huge element. Um, but, yeah, I... Yeah, you're getting me thinking now, Cormac. I'm having to kind of go, oh, yeah, how is my written piece going to, you know, because it's, it's got to kind of be standalone. But equally, I think that this is another thing, Will, which I don't know whether you're already thinking about this or may come to think it, but um, people will say, oh, so, yeah, where are you at? What, what chapters have you done? But the way I work is I kind of sometimes I make first, then write, if I have to reflect on it. I very rarely write first, then make. It's kind of a, a dual process and therefore I can't tell you quite what my chapters will be for my written piece until I've produced a lot more of the content so um yeah it's it's an exploration I suppose I think it's interesting that you know you you have another layer of layer of complexity to you know like what is a video essay when you consider original footage and it seems like you Gemma and you Cormac through your industry experiences, you have this sort of personal connection to the topics that you're studying. Like Gemma, Birmingham, you have a personal connection to that. So, um, and Cormac, you've worked with sound. So um, what role does original music or original sound, or original footage, and even you will, you're in New York, you're working with New York City archives. You know, what, what role does that have in your video essay work? That's that's a great question. Um, it's it's something that that I'm thinking about for a you know because this thing although I'm saying I'm going to be finished in twelve months there's still a lot of work to be done and there's still a lot of video essay work to be done um, and I am actually thinking about a piece I, I'm in the process of hopefully setting up a collaborative piece with an old friend of mine who is a, a film sound practitioner um, which would be about um, about me actually creating some new sounds um, that we would kind of that would well I'm not going to give too much away because it may not it may not happen this I think this is the other thing about any of these kind of grand ambitions that sometimes you have for for some of these projects sometimes they just don't come to fruition um, but the, there's definitely I, I, that's definitely been something that I've been thinking about and I think it's something that I've seen in a lot of you know I saw in a lot of the work when I started um, listening to the podcast and particularly practitioners like Johannes Bonotto who would include was one of the first people that I saw including kind of original footage that they'd shot themselves um but uh but this would be the first time that I would be creating something making something creative for it rather than just shooting a piece of footage that might kind of inform it so um I think it's a really interesting question and uh it's I suppose it's it's part of what I want to try and do to bring, as you say, to bring that kind of background of mine, which was in that creative side of it, and this, try and bring those two things together a little bit and, and see what they say to each other. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of this for me is kind of sort of navigating all of the different interests I have in what film sound is and whether that's 
me making it or me listening to it or me hoping that someone else might listen to it in the way that I do and kind of get something out of it. Um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting question. Yeah, I'm um, <clears throat> really interesting, actually, because I, again, thinking back to that initial proposal I put in, I think I mentioned something about kind of the idea of maybe filming almost a mini city symphony of my Birmingham, you know, as I perceive the city and how that varies from what I verge is maybe from the more kind of, you know, the word gritty is one that I'm playing with a lot. And, you know, the, the entries I've done for the TV dictionary have maybe been kind of looking at the word gritty to see how that can intersect with different TV shows um, based in Birmingham. But I, my personal experience of Birmingham, but then I'm very aware that that's me speaking as a, a white middle class woman, you know, who's moved here after living in the slightly more rural Midlands. And I think it's really interesting about how we, that personal, like you said, Emily, um, I don't think you can ever be purely objective doing videographic work. I don't know if you would agree with that, Will and Cormac, but I think that the process of making is a very personal one and we are always going to project some of our own sensibilities or experiences into how we manipulate or otherwise that footage and I mean certainly I'd like to include some original stuff in in whatever I eventually produce but even I think integrating interviews um in you know the way that we can mix those with existing screen texts is that's something I'm interested in too so yeah much to think on this co-mingling of of the writing and the video one thing that i've encountered a few times is this kind of resistance to videographic criticism as scholarship or it'll often say well it will never take the place of writing and what's funny to me when i hear that is i don't think i've ever heard anyone in the videographic criticism academic community like say that <laughs> like, like i've never encountered someone's like well in 10 years we won't be writing anymore we'll just be doing this <laughs> like i've never heard that and i don't think anyone thinks that i've heard people say that oh i'm much more interested in doing this than writing at this point in my career but i've noticed this defensiveness that i don't really quite understand when what i'm hearing you say is and what i've been thinking about is that this actually, this combination actually has us thinking about the purpose and function of writing even more, I think, um, because we have that audiovisual contrast, right? We have to justify why is this a written essay or a written supplement rather than a part of the video? And to me, that's just an ultimate case for why writing is, is so great, no? <laughs> I think uh, you need to talk to the um, colleague of mine, who, another PhD candidate audiovisual called Ella Wright. And her, again, I don't want to um, say too much because it's so, she articulates it so much better than me, but she's very interested in why we still advocate so much for the written when we have video essay or however you want to call working with audiovisual material. So, um, and her PhD thesis is looking at just that. So, you could probably have a really interesting conversation there. Um, but yeah, I, I actually find it frustrating sometimes. I think if we, if we can, if we're using videographic criticism, for example, to find our arguments to create new ways of seeing things, to then explain that in writing as well. I mean, that kind of, to me, goes a little bit against show, don't tell. Um, so I would like to see more opportunities to present videographic work in its videographic form without a written accompaniment. And I don't know if that's controversial, but I don't know what you think. No, totally. I totally agree. I think I, I think that's very exciting and there should 100% be projects like that. I think what, what's interesting to me is that there, I think I've just encountered when, when people hear that, they interpret it as an attack on writing. Which it's which is it just which which I just I just think that's funny to me because I I don't I don't really I don't get that like it's just something different. But have you have either of you have and Cormac feel free to to chime in. But have either of you encountered? Um, I we, we've talked about how people think this is easy, but anything to just of like oh this somehow isn't a real PhD or or less than or maybe or our practice research PhDs within kind of you know your universities and UK higher ed just so established that's not really a, 
a phenomenon anymore. Yeah, I I don't know I don't know about the um, I think it is it's clearly it is clearly established to a certain extent, and I think um, at Birmingham there's actually a, a, a reasonably good and un, un, reasonably long track record of, of people doing practice research, you know, documentary led PhDs and things like that. Um, and I know that at Glasgow there has been at least one other videographic PhD that's graduated from there. Um, I do get a um, I do get the sense that sometimes when I set out to explain my PhD, it does, you know, you can see an eyebrow just sort of raise ever so slightly when they hear the term video essay because, well, you know, what what is uh, what's the, the what's the general perception of a video essay? You know, the odds of someone having engaged with our work uh, and, and the kind of the the kind of the more scholarly led or the more academically led video essays versus having been vaguely aware of something on YouTube. I mean, they're going to go to that as their, um, as their reference point, probably first, unless, you know, unless they're already part of the community or unless they're aware of the community. So, um, yeah, I think in that respect, perhaps I have had the odd, um, yeah, the odd raised eyebrow at this being a, being a PhD, really? Oh, that, that sounds great. And in the back of my head, I know great means that sounds really easy. <laughs> and, and probably not as, not as hard as my 80,000 word thesis that I had to write is probably what they're thinking at that point. Um, but, you know, on the, on the point of writing, um, I've, I, I am nearly almost finished with my first draft of my first chapter. And I've actually really enjoyed it, getting, getting back into writing. Not that I'm like, not that I've thrown out my keyboard and haven't written anything for ages, but, um, you know, like a focused long piece of writing, which needs all of that time and effort and thinking. And, you know, a lot of the same time and effort and thinking that goes into a video essay, but um, a very different way of thinking and then thinking through the content as well. Um, and I, I have actually enjoyed that. I've enjoyed going back to it, but now I'm seeing the the different time and the different, brain space that each of those things needs and um you know they are they are t such different disciplines to to kind of engage with um i think again it's you know it's indicative of the the, the phd actually being you know really valid as a as a phd the, the videographic work definitely and i think it's important to note that you know I, I think this this kind of thing is important to talk about again because you know you hear stories every now and again of folks who encounter resistance or stories of folks who try to pitch an audiovisual PhD at their university and it's it's rejected. But then you hear stories like I, I I think it was Drew Morton who wrote an issue of the Cinephiles about kind of using video essay to get tenure in the U.S. and he he says that he expected his dean to kind of raise an eyebrow at that and then he went back and emailed his dean years later. It was like, oh, did you think this was weird? And the dean was like, oh no, not at all. Like I didn't even, I didn't even think about it. Like it was great. So you know, you know, not trying to make generalizations, but I think it's important to to talk about. And I think obviously we're heading in the right direction, right? Like I think it's just becoming more and more and more accepted, um, but important to talk about nonetheless. Um, Cormac, your project in particular got me thinking about something um, at the UMass Video Essay Conference. Um, Scott McDonald was there, who's done a lot of interviewing of experimental filmmakers and the like. And I was talking to him and he, he was just loving the video essays. And he was like, oh, you can almost make that you can make video essays about video essays. And he was talking about kind of how it could be this never ending, we were talking about this never ending cycle. And I'm just curious, did you think about like doing that for your project? Like almost like a making of director's cut of your video? Because that, that could serve the role that I imagine some of your writing is playing, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, so, so the piece that I, that I presented at UMass was like this kind of, this return to previous work, which again, I, I mean, it's, it, it's something that, that I know has been done in, in the videographic space, but not, you know, not that much, you know, a, a video essay is a closed piece of work and you publish it and you finish it and you move on with your life. But, I felt like I was able to kind of take this interest that I'd had, this experimental interest in, in deformative work, um, in more parameterized practice, which I, 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 
you know, took a lot of inspiration from Jason Mattel and some of Alan O'Leary's writing about um, experimental practice and kind of went off and just did a lot of um, short experimental pieces with no specific outcome in mind, which is really challenging to just finish it and go, here it is, and move on with my life and not like have a grand plan around it. But that became this really kind of freeing experience to then take some of that and revisit a previous work and yeah, make a video essay about a video essay. Um, I have, I, I, so so one of the one of the things that I'm working on in the minute is this super volume project, which is a, a larger practice, which is going to involve a practical experiment and participants and sort of video content of them participating in an experiment and conversations with them and then get built into kind of a section of this this blog site I have and also be part of my submission. And that's that's a that is me, I suppose, looking at the making of the video essay and, and what that what content comprises the video essay in, especially when you're thinking about sound, which, you know, in itself you can't see. So it, it needs to be evoked in some way. And I, I felt like a really interesting way to do that would be to have people actually physically manipulated and, and watch that instead so um yeah the, i mean i love the making i love talking to people about how they made video essays it's one of my favorite things so <laughs> so the making of the video essays Same. um <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the making the video essays is, is brilliant i love that Gemma, feel free to to comment on any of that but i want to i also want to circle back to something that you said earlier um and maybe that this will be the uh transition to where you two can give me advice um, as I start this journey. But one of the things you said was in, in thinking about how you ultimately structure your hour of, of video and how you didn't know if some of your works would kind of become vignettes um, in a larger work. And I think one of the things, like I have a general chapter outline of like, I want this chapter to deal with this film or filmmaker and this archive and this and that. But as I'm working on my current first video, which is on the work of George Kuchar, I'm getting all these other little ideas for like little videos that could be like made as part of this that I don't imagine, like I don't yet know if they would even fit. So I'm like, oh, would I just be wasting my time or should I not be doing that? Like, how do you, how do you think about that? Or should you not, should I not even think about that and just kind of let it, let it go? Like, like, do you have voices in your head that are like, like the, that devil and the angel on each shoulder? Like, <laughs> totally. what happens there? <laughs> I mean, I literally had this conversation with my supervisors last week where I said, oh, you know, it's been great recently because I've been doing lots of little projecty things, but I feel like I'm not actually doing the actual thesis. And I was like, is it okay to be doing these things? And they're like, yeah, um, because they're really supportive and cool. But, um, you know, I think, yeah, you've got to explore. Um, and I think if a little idea comes in, um, you never know what else that might spark. And I think that's, for me, like, again, I love working on the Premiere Pro editing timeline because that's where I find things out, you know, that I wouldn't necessarily... And, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, despite what I said about wanting, um, you know, more opportunities to just present video work, I love writing. And I think, actually, ironically, first and foremost, I'm probably a more natural writer than I am a filmmaker. Um, but I... You know, I love the opportunity that the PhD is providing to bring those two together. But I think, yeah, when you have these little thoughts of, oh, what about if I put that with that? Or I've thought about this. And yeah, I would, because you're right at the start, yeah? So, and I mean, you know, I'm somebody who frequently goes, I can't do this. Um, but, you know, I will get there. We will all get there. Because I think when you're passionate about something, you know, you'll, you'll make the time. And ultimately, I think it's quite nice being a student because you have that space to, to do those little side projects and explore and like, I don't know if you feel the same Cormac but um, for me especially this year kind of having had a year out to um, become a mum and everything and like I really I I really thought on my maternity leave that I would be watching kind of bits of tv with the baby and working on my PhD no that did not happen but actually coming back to it fresh from that year out um, especially in the last few months like, I felt really excited by it all again and I think so giving yourself space to look into other things or just kind of see what a little question might take you to is and I personally would say that's quite important yeah yeah I, I totally I, I totally agree I think um you know I, I I think my my own 
ideas, my own kind of practice came more alive for me when I embraced the idea that I was going to make some experiments that had no no purpose beyond being made so I could get them out of my head and into Vimeo and then I could move on with my life and try something else. Um, but also so they could kind of live there. I, you know, I, I suppose I started out with a whole other idea, but none of the work that I did for that idea and none of the work that I've done at any point in the PhD has been wasted. I'm, you know, I'm still, I'm still using and I'm still reflecting on a lot of the research that I did for a whole different PhD idea, but it's still super valuable to me at this point because it has allowed me to have this wider kind of wider view of what I'm, what I'm looking at, what I'm thinking about and what I'm, what I'm trying to make. And that's also how I then want to talk about it. You know, I just, uh, I was just writing the other day and I suddenly remembered uh, like a, an experimental piece by, um, I think it was by John Smith uh, called the girl chewing gum that I'd watched years you know, years ago as part of something else. And I was like, Oh, of course I remember that now. And I, I remember thinking that that was great. And then it, it kind of influenced this and I'd completely forgotten about that association. So those kinds of things. Yeah. I think any, any opportunity you have to play around with it is definitely useful. I was just, I wanted to quickly go back, Will, to what, um, when you were asking about kind of how people respond and like the establishment of practice research, because um, although, I mean, it's it's so lovely to hear Cormac saying that it's really established at Birmingham, which I, I believe it now is. I mean, there's seven of us currently doing AB PhDs, but it's still, um, you know, when it comes to kind of formal processes, there's certainly, you know, like I had to write a cover letter to go with my submission for my progress panel in my second year to say, you know, I'm not just submitting a chapter and a synopsis and a this and that. I'm also submitting audiovisual work. Um, the ethical review process has been a challenge for all of us because, um, you know, all the paperwork and everything is specifically geared at people who are doing written work or kind of maybe more qualitative research, you know, data sets, things like that. But I think there are still challenges and I think it's, it is definitely growing and becoming more and more normal but um yeah i would say that institutionally um and i, I can't speak for other uk unis but um it's not a straightforward a process i would say from some of the admin sides um and i don't know whether that is useful or relevant and sorry to kind of backtrack but i just thought that might be worth knowing um no it's 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 very worth knowing um and i think there is that kind of like there is that element to embarking on this, right? Like knowing that you will have to uh, explain <laughs> things or, or maybe do a little bit of bit, bit of handholding, right? But I guess that kind of just goes with the territory and will make it easier for right the, the next person. And, but in, in a way also, it, it can only help your, your ability to, in, in a way you've been preparing for like this podcast conversation, right? Like having to, to talk about your project and explain why you're doing it and all of these things, right? Like you, every question I probably threw at you, you're like, oh, I've been asked this before <laughs> in one form or another. Um, and, and it's super useful to me because I mean, I'll share like when I was first trying to figure out my PhD thing, like I was very hesitant at first to like do a videographic PhD. I think because I mean, obviously I'm based in the US and so it's not like, it's it's just a different way of thinking about things here. Um, but I think like finding, I feel very lucky to have like had conversations with folks, including Cormac, um, who like, I, I didn't even know that you could do a like a part-time PhD or that like increasingly unis are being more accommodating for uh, distance learning or remote work or, or, or whatever they call it. I was like, wait, what? really? <laughs> and so that kind of get, set me on this journey. So I think a lot of this stuff, it's just about, yeah, like having conversations with people and trying to figure out like what you want to do. And once I got there, I got like really excited about the prospect of doing graduate work in a way that I wasn't. Um, I think it was even the, yeah, like talking to, to, to Jason Mattel, who has talked me through everything since I was his advisee sophomore year in college, but was like, you don't really sound excited about this other thing you're pitching. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I'm not. Um, and so, you know, hear, hearing stories like, you know, from, from YouTube is, is, is very exciting. Um, and I'm wondering what advice you would have as we kind of wrap up here, either for me or for other folks who are considering 
a videographic PhD? Like what? I, I'm guessing you have no regrets <laughs> um, in pursuing this as a format, but just for for um, for for someone who is thinking about it, what what would you say to them? What would you want them to know? <laughs> Given that you've already uh, blamed me for partly for doing your PhD, well, I can't really say don't do it. Um, no, I, I don't regret it at all. I think um, I have, um, I've definitely gotten better on a lot of things because of this. Um, I, and, and it has been, okay. I think the, the thing that maybe we haven't mentioned, um, and, and I think one thing that should be mentioned is um, there is a wonderful, supportive, enthusiastic community that exists for you. If you're interested in doing a videographic PhD, there's a community waiting for you <laughs> to to join. And I think that was one of the things that um, was so helpful for me when I started out, because I started, I started my PhD at, towards the end of 2019. I think the video essay podcast had been going for a couple of months and I was through listening to the podcast and engaging with the community that was, was existing around it. Suddenly I was, I, I felt much more comfortable about, about trying to do this thing about trying to engage. So, you know, one, one, one piece of advice would be, I don't need to give this to you, but one piece of advice for anyone else who might be considering would be to, to take advantage of that community of practice and of uh, makers who are massively generous with their time um, and their expertise um, as part of your kind of your, your growing and your learning. Um, I've already read your, your proposal or at least one version of it will. And um, I suppose that would be my other advice is that your proposal is brilliant. And by comparison, my proposal as I started out was a bit of a shambles. So um, spending time on, on on that early doors, I think, is really beneficial. Um, it will change. I imagine yours will change as well. Um, but I, I think the stronger it is at the outset and the stronger your understanding of that videographic component is, I think the, um, the better it will be for you in the long run, definitely. Well, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. But see, that's the trick is you start a podcast in over four years <laughs> You get one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions with brilliant people, and then you take all their ideas and influence, and you're doing something like that. And so I had now. Well, no, actually, the trick is someone else starts a podcast, and then you just listen to it, so you don't even have to do the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, 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 well. Thank you, and I'll use the, I'll use this to shout out that my um, you've more than returned the favor because I needed a, a VCR as part of my uh, project <laughs> and Cormac, I was messaging him like eBay links being like, does this look good? Cause that's what you, when you make something like Panscan Venkman, you anoint yourself the, the VHS guy. So, and I got it up and working over the weekend. So that was uh, tons of fun. Um, but Gemma, yeah, same, same, same question to you for any budding videographic PhDs out there. <laughs> I mean, Everything Cormac said, you know, um, and I have to say, like, especially for me during the pandemic, the video essay podcast and those kind of homework exercises you set, Will, they were actually, for me, um, a way of carrying on in that time when everything was like, oh, you know, the world is going to pot. And yeah, so, and certainly, I think partly through listening to podcasts and starting to put my stuff out there through Twitter or Vimeo and you know that's led to opportunities people like Ariel Avissa have been in touch and that's been amazing so I yeah thank you very much Will and I really want to read your PhD proposal um but beyond like what Cormac said about you know really engaging I mean even if you shy you know chatting on discord um has been great but I think it's really important to pick your supervisors carefully and you know, if if whether you're doing it full time or part time, you're going to be working with people who are going to support you. They're going to kind of nudge you towards things that, um, you know, you might not have confidence that you can do, but they'll do it with your best interests at heart. But you you need to think about who you're going to build those working relationships with, who who's going to be able to challenge you, but you know that you can trust as well to kind of have your back on these things and give you the guidance that you want to need. So, and I mean my I said I've got co-supervisors and then 
James Walters isn't particularly kind of practical based with his um, work, but he he thinks about my practice in terms of all the guidance he gives me, which is wonderful. And coupled with Richard, who has, you know, a very practice based background and focuses very much on, you know, as we were talking about earlier, the content and the methodology in that way. You know, for me, they're a, a, just the perfect supervisory team. <laughs> which I feel very lucky about. So I think that would be my top tip. And also, like I said before, just like go down those rabbit holes. Um, I think if you if you start doing your PhD and yeah, mine's changing all the time. Um, and I know that eventually I will have to be like, no, buckle down now. This is this is the time to actually get the thing going. But um, yeah, it's fun. And I have no regrets either. Um, yeah, it's full on. But um yeah, I think I'll probably be quite sad when it does end, but I'm, I'm at least a couple of years away from that yet. So there's a, there's plenty of time to still carry on exploring. And I would say that to, to you, Will, and to anyone else thinking about it, just and enjoy it. And yeah, I think if you go into it, looking at it as something that you're doing for yourself, possibly with a career goal in mind, but also kind of like it's, I mean, for me, it's, it's a privilege to be able to do a PhD and you know a videographic PhD in particular you know it's still there's not a huge huge number of us doing them um so yeah enjoy well thank you for that I think go down rabbit holes is the perfect advice and I think really captures the spirit of videographic criticism um and Cormac and Gemma have both mentioned um there's a videographic discord server um within that a channel um that Gemma and Cormac have really taken the lead on I think one of you even started it yeah, and there's been great talk there of students kind of supporting each other from, you know, BA students, masters, um, and PhD students kind of thinking about this thing. So if you want to link to that, please be in touch um, and we'll be happy to share it. And, you know, again, kind of pay it forward and think through kind of all of these different things. Um, but before we go, Gemma, I wanted to give you an opportunity to plug. Um, you have an event coming up that, that deals with some of these uh some of these questions. So could you uh, yeah, share information about that with us and kind of what we can expect? And then uh, also I'll of course link to it um, on the website, and stuff, but give us a, give us a sneak peek. <laughs> Myself, Nina Jones and Ella Wright, um, all three of us doing the AV PhD at Birmingham. Um, and we are organizing a creative practice colloquium um, under the banner B Film, which is what Rob Stone heads up, which is the Birmingham Centre for Film and TV Studies. Um, and this colloquium is specifically geared at people doing doctoral research using audiovisual practice methodologies. Um, and it's at the end of June, um, although we have closed registrations online, if anybody would be interested in coming, um, both either online or in person, um, we have spaces. So um, I'm sure Will could I put you in touch with me or find me on Twitter. Um, but yeah, it's, we're hoping it's just going to be a really fun day where we can talk about kind of identities, methodologies, kind of explore what that means to all of us. Um, I know Cormac's coming, so I'm really excited to actually meet you, not on a screen. Um, so that'll be super cool. And yeah, we're going to have a bit of a practice exercise in the afternoon, um, which I won't say too much about because it's that will ruin the surprise um but yeah we just think it should be a really fun and interesting day and we're hoping actually that some of what we unpack there might go forward um towards maybe being in a journal as well but we'd love to hear from anybody regardless of discipline um i know that we already have people coming from kind of drama from more um history ethnography all sorts of different areas so yeah the Creative Practice Colloquium is at UAB on the 28th of June. Thank you both so much uh, for joining today. Um, I'll be hitting you both up with questions in the coming months and years. Um, and maybe uh, we can check in on this podcast again down the line when we, uh, you know, uh, want to keep, keep the conversation going because this really just feels like the beginning. Thank you. Thank you.